Okay, so uh, uh, first I extend warm well, welcome to Rahul, who is uh, who has agreed to deliver a lecture on a particular very important topic because uh, what I perceived uh, that you know when we were witnessing a kind of lockdown. Uh, many field reports, many newspapers were covering about the distress which were prevailing in the labor market. So uh, reverse migration, return migration, then massive pressure on wage rates to go down. And then, uh, you know, all field reports actually express the concern, but we were actually eagerly waiting for official data to come. But now when official data actually came uh, with uh, periodic labor force survey, it actually shows uh, something which is not expected. So in that respect, Rahul, who is a student professor in this, so he is going to deliver a lecture on that. And I think there are many queries which are associated with the primary labor survey uh, data, which is recently uh, launched and basically covers the lockdown period. So I think many of our queries would be solved once we listen to Rahul's talk. So again, I, I don't uh, take much time, rather we would have uh, more discussion. So, so I invite Rahul to deliver his lecture and then we will have, I think, uh, how much time do we have? It's a three or 3.30? Uh, so we, we, we have it for one hour, two to three, hour, so okay. 45 minutes, okay. you know, 40, so 40, 45 minutes. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, 40 to 45 minutes of talk and then for 15 and 20 okay. minutes, we, will, we can yeah. have a discussion over that. Okay. Okay, over to Rao. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Avnindra, for the opportunity. Thanks everyone at uh, the Jindal School of Public Policy for inviting me here. Um, just to start off with, um, actually this talk, I mean, it's my fault, I should have made this clearer. This does not cover the lockdown period. Our aim is to show a sort of snapshot of, uh, not uh, is to sort of look at the dynamic processes that are happening in the Indian labor market prior to lockdown. But uh, we are looking at work and this will hopefully form a basis to give you an idea of the methodology that we are looking at to study the lockdown and uh, questions uh, moving forward. So if I may just, uh, if you could just give me a second I'll just start off my slideshow. Yeah, is it visible? I, um, I suppose I should have started off with Zoom etiquette with beginning by saying, am I audible and is it visible? But I think uh, all that has been established. <clears throat> so um, this is, I'm very excited to present work that I'm doing with a colleague of mine from Azim Premji University, Dr. Paritosh Nath, where we are trying to examine the question of the dynamics of, uh, lab of the labor market in urban India. Now, uh, we think that, you know, we're very excited about this work because we feel we are able to provide some sort of original contributions and insights to what is happening in the urban labor market. Till now, if anyone wanted to do work on large scale data work on the question of Indian labor, we normally relied on the employment unemployment surveys of the National Sample Survey Office. These are quinquennial surveys. I think, um, you know, everyone is sort of kind of familiar with them, large scale surveys, data sets. Uh, very extensive that have a lot of information about employment, unemployment, the employment and unemployment situation of the labor in India. However, the problem is that these surveys are cross-sectional surveys. So they study a single individual at a single point in time. So we have no idea of what happens to that individual after they have been surveyed. For example, if I survey someone in 1993 to say that they are unemployed, what happens after that? How long does it take before they are employed? All of these questions we are unable to answer. Whatever analysis we get of the dynamics of labor can only be seen by looking at these two separate cross-sectional surveys over time and then sort of uh, studying it in the aggregate. We are unable to see how individual characteristics can shape labor dynamics. We are unable to see what is happening at the ground in a more sort of granular detail of what are the dynamics of processes in India, in labor markets in India. Now, much of our understanding on these labor dynamics, whatever we do have, come from fieldwork based studies. The work of Jan Bremen, for, for instance, uh, his seminal work on what he has termed footloose labor is basically a sort of dynamic analysis of what is happening, how people are transitioning through the labor market. At the level of large scale data sets, till the release of the recent PLFS, at the very least, we didn't have an understanding, we didn't have an ability to study these questions. 
there were some researchers who did try and tackle these questions using data from the india human development survey in 2004-5 and 2011-12 so the ihds if i'm not mistaken they surveyed individuals in 2004-5 and then tried to survey the same individual individuals in 11-12 so there are there have been some work looking at these transitions of individuals um, studying the same person over time the problem with these studies is that the period is too vast from 2004-5 to 2011-12 and doesn't allow us to understand these dynamic short-term processes um, also this this sort of um, study design does not allow us to study the question of unemployment because it's very rare for a person to be unemployed from 2004-5 all the way till 11-12 that doesn't really allow us to examine what's happening with the dynamics of the labor market in sort of in a more granular way the release of the periodic labor force survey when it was first done in 2017-18 uh, those of us who are, who work in the questions of labor will be familiar that it came with a lot of controversy one was because it signaled that the finding was that the unemployment rate in india had increased significantly to about 6% 6.5% 6 if i'm not mistaken now um, there was a lot of debate because a lot of people said that the design of the sample uh, in the new plfs didn't allow things uh, results to be compared over time whereas some people were saying the sample may be different but population estimates are robust we don't need to go into that what is relevant for our study is that the plfs contained a very important and interesting methodological innovation it allowed for the construction of longitudinal panels in the sense that they interviewed individuals in a quarter and then the same individuals and the same households were revisited in three subsequent quarters so what happens is that you can actually build this panel of households and individuals who have been interviewed four times across a year once every quarter right so we have constructed two panels two such panels one that goes from the first quarter july september of 2017-18 to the fourth quarter april june sorry uh, that goes from the first quarter july september of 2017 to the fourth quarter april june of 2018 and another panel that goes from the first quarter of 2018 to the fourth quarter of 2019 so we have two separate panels each panel fo uh, following the same individual over four quarters that allow us now to see what are these processes that are happening in the labor market how is it changing over time what are the sort of transitions that individuals do through the labor force these panels were constructed only for urban households so it has not been done for rural areas uh, but which is actually a problem because there's a lot happening in rural india right now at the moment that we really need to get a handle on but at the very least we have now this ability to look at dynamic labor markets in the urban context which provides us you know a huge fertile scope for future research and addressing questions that we desperately need to address but had no way of examining and this is where we believe that our uh, paper that our work represents a sort of original contribution to the field of labor studies in india because we are able to now empirically show and empirically estimate some movements and some uh, effects in the indian labor market which till now we have spoken about but had no way of measuring so i'll come to this later how the panel exactly is constructed if at the end if anyone wants to go through that and discuss that we can do it later this is just to show that these two panels are roughly homogeneous they're more or less the same they have been constructed in a way uh, that they're more or less the same they both consists of around 31000 individuals each panel and in terms of demographic characteristics they are roughly the same yes there's some discrepancies between the two panels but they're more or less the same so this gives us sort of confidence that we have two comparable uh samples and any differences that we see in aggregate events and aggregate measurements that we are able to see are a good estimator or a good uh measurement of the economic changes happening from uh, 2017-18 to 2018 rather than being influenced by the individual makeup of this panel so this is just like a very very simple very basic robustness check so what are we studying 
we are trying to study and encapsulate the probabilities of movement from one state in the labor market to another. Any individual can exist in any one of three possible states. You're either employed, you're either unemployed, or you are out of the labor force entirely. Now, an individual can be in any one of these three, uh, these three states in time t and can transition to any, uh, any of these three states in time t plus one. So if I am employed in time t, I can be employed in time t plus one. So I've retained my job or I've moved to a different job. I could be unemployed. I could lose my job or I could move the, out of the labor force entirely. Similarly, if I was unemployed in time T or if I am out of the labor force in time T. In this sense, we have nine possible transitions that can occur in the labor market. And this is the entire universe of transitions that can occur within the labor market. So studying all of these transitions enable us to get a feel for the flows in the labor market and not just measure aggregate flows, but measure the directions of these flows we'll be able to say how much new jobs are being created in the labor market, proxied by the movement from people from unemployment to employment or from out of the labor force to employment. We'll be able to proxy how, at what rate are jobs being lost, which can be proxied by the measured by the movement from employment to unemployment. So a study of these nine possible transitions allow us to really get a feel for what is happening in the labor market in a dynamic sense, in a sense that we could not study with earlier uh, sample surveys, with the earlier NSSO surveys. Keep in mind again that this is only for the urban sector because the, these revisits were not done for the rural sector. So essentially, it's a, I mean, it's a very simple methodology. We are just calculating probabilities. If the individual is in state a at time t and moves to state b in time t plus one we calculate the transition probability it's a rough estimate of what is the probability that a person in state a at time t moves to state b in time t plus one so we take a, a, a transition probability a b is measured by we take the total number of people who move from state a to state B between time T and time T plus one and divide it by the total number of people who have existed in state A in time period T. It's a very simple calculation of probabilities. If at any point I'm not very clear or if I made a sort of mistake in uh, explore, exploring and explaining some of these concepts, if you would like a clarification, please do stop me and let me know if, if it's not very clear. So what we are trying to do in this paper and in these results is just to provide an introductory examination of patterns of dynamics in the economy, right? We are not, this is a preliminary study. We have a lot of work. We're working on another paper right now, which looks at it in a more fine grained fashion. There's a huge fertile scope for lots of work to be done in this paper which is available as a working paper on the website of the Center for Sustainable Employment of the Azim Premji University. We're just looking at an introductory examination of broad patterns. So we pick up individuals who are in the first quarter and study their transition probabilities based on between the first quarter and the fourth quarter. So we are not looking at movements from quarter one to quarter two, quarter two to three, three to four. We're providing a broad introductory look. So we're just looking at quarter one and quarter four and measuring these transition probabilities. Um, so therefore we calculate nine such transition probabilities for urban individuals of the working age 15 to 65. We differentiate demographic groups, which we will show results differentiated by gender and by levels of education or education only schooling and graduates. The paper has a few more detailed uh, studies with a few, few more detailed disaggregations for this talk and I'm just presenting in terms of broad gender and education. The labor market status, what their exact status is, whether EU or OLF is determined by the current weekly status. So they're asked what have they done in the reference period of a week in the previous week. So there is a problem here because uh, if I could just go into the limitations of the study, the first limitation is that 
we are looking at it only between quarter one and quarter four and not uh, in the, qu the quarters in between. And secondly, we are sort of making an assumption that whatever their status is in the reference week, characterize their status for the entire quarter, which obviously may not be the case, right? I may interview someone in July and in the reference week, they may be unemployed, but they get a job by the first week of August. I will not be able to track that because, well, that's the limitations of the data. So we assume that whatever their current weekly status is, that characterizes their status for the entire quarter. You are uh, classified as employed if you have the statuses 11 to 72. We are not making a disaggregation of the kinds of employment here. We're just saying whether you're employed or not. In future work that we're doing actually concurrently, we're trying to get a feel of movements between kinds of employment and forms of employment. You are unemployed if you have a status of 81 and 82, and you're considered out of the labor force if you have a status of 91 and above. This is standard uh, labor market work. All those who are familiar with the NSS and these uh, codes will be sort of familiar with this. So these are our transition matrices. Just a second. So essentially, if I were to say this number here, 91.7, it's essentially saying that 91% of all those employed individuals in the first quarter of 1718 retain their employment in the fourth quarter of 2017-18, right? This says all of those individuals who are employed in the first quarter of 2018-19 are employed in the fourth quarter of 2018-19. We don't know if they, if they change jobs that we, we are unable to see with, the, with this data. So we're not able to see that aspect of dynamism. But otherwise, I mean, this is, we think it's a very interesting way to look at the labor market in ways that have not been done before. So broad, what are the sort of broad outcomes we are able to see? Firstly, we see that the Indian labor market is really not that dynamic. There is very little movement from out of the labor force into the labor force. As you can see in across both years, if you are in the labor force in your first quarter, there's really a, there's about a 95% chance that you are remain outside of the labor force in the fourth quarter. So there's very little movement from, uh, from outside the labor force in. So this is not a very dynamic economy as things stand. There's a relatively less movement from unemployment into employment. So only 20% roughly across both years, only 20% of those who are unemployed in the first quarter find employment a year hence. I mean, this is pretty significant. What we can see is a slight improvement in economic conditions from 2017, 18 to 18, 19. The proportions of those, I mean, the proportions of those already employed who retain employment increase marginally those who move from employment to unemployment, that percentage decreases and the percentage of those who are unemployed and move into employment increases. So there is some sort of improvement in the labor market conditions that are happening. Um, we see a reduced movement from outside the labor force in, which actually in the context of the Indian economy speaks to an improvement of living conditions. Because there's a, there's a large literature on the phenomenon of distress employment, which basically says that those who are outside of the labor force, when they move in, they largely do so in times of household insecurity with respect to incomes. So they move to supplement incomes of the prime earner. So if we see that percentage decrease, we can testify to a slight improvement in living standards in an income sense. This is also tied in with patriarchal structures, which see women's work being valued only in dire necessity. So obviously there's a huge problem there, but if you have to broadly look at it in terms of um, uh, employment generation, there is some increase over time. However, this increase masks significant weaknesses as well, right? There is a huge problem here of entrenchment of an unemployment. I prefer to use the word entrenchment rather than long term. 
across both years nearly 58% of those who are unemployed in the first quarter remain unemployed by the fourth quarter and that's extremely worrying this is like year long unemployment for nearly 58% of those who are unemployed this really speaks to a problem of employment generation and secondly if we were to look at it the movement from unemployment out of the labor force 19.7% in 2017-18 and 17.5% in 2018-19 this speaks to the discouraged worker effect so this is essentially saying around 20% uh, and 17% of unemployed individuals at the beginning of the year decide to leave looking for jobs entirely by the end of the year and this is these are significant numbers it's like nearly a fifth of all those who are unemployed leave the labor force entirely after a year because they haven't found a job the unemployment rate only measures those who are unemployed not those who have left the labor force so the reduction in unemployment rate over these years will mask significant weaknesses where many people are unable to find jobs and just leaving and that's perhaps could be a reason why the unemployment rate has fallen we are trying to decompose changes in the unemployment rate using the these transition probabilities which this methodology now allows us to do that and we think that this is also significant because the discouraged worker effect has been spoken about very significantly in the context of us labor markets we haven't got a measure of that for india and we are estimates are we think we feel perhaps one of the first estimates of this very important movement and important aspect of dynamics in the labor market which we are able to sort of measure and empirically um, capture now these are very broad based probabilities that are taken of the entire um, sample we further calculate transition estimates through the use of logistic regressions i won't go into the detail very significantly we can discuss it after this session i would prefer to sort of uh, get all the results out and then we can have a discussion on them later essentially we now we run logistic regressions for each sample right so if i am calculating the transition probability of from employment to unemployment for instance in 1718 i'll take only those who are employed i will mark those who are who move from employment to say unemployment as one those who don't as zero if i want to measure the transition probability of employment to unemployment so i take only those who are employed whoever makes the relevant transition are marked as one whoever doesn't is marked as zero i run a logistic regression with individual demographic characteristics and i calculate then marginal effects from my um, logistic regression to sort of give me an idea of transition probabilities after controlling for various demographic estimates uh, demographic characteristics this allows me to get greater precision in my estimates to see what is the transition probability for men after controlling for say education and caste what is the transition probabilities for women after controlling for age education and caste and it also allows me to calculate confidence intervals through when i use these marginal effects which allows me to see whether these estimates that i've got are real, how strong are they how confident am i in saying that this is a really good capture of what is happening okay the demographic variables we choose are age gender education status and caste in this we are only looking at gender and education and even in education only those who have some amount of schooling and graduates um just to show some very stark uh, outcomes in terms of caste there isn't much variation in transition prob in these transition probabilities between castes it requires a lot more digging to see what is happening and therefore we didn't show them in this preliminary paper which is just about outlining broad uh, patterns so this is the conditional transition probabilities for men these are all marginal effects from logistic regressions for each sample for to calculate for each of these uh, probabilities the similar sort of patterns that we saw with the aggregate are repeated here there is an increase in the flow of men or in the retention of employment for men 94.6 and 95.6 right there is a reduction in the amount of men employed men who are unemployed and there is an increase 
in the movement of men from unemployment to employment however that isn't much that's only 27.5 i mean we have to see that the the worrying aspect from this is that we we get an idea that the indian labor market is really not that dynamic there isn't that many jobs being created over a year only a quarter of those unemployed are absorbed at the end of a year that's pretty significant what is worrying is the very high extent of the entrenchment of unemployment for men right that's 60% and it increases to 62% the figures in brackets are the confidence intervals of these marginal effects calculated from the uh, from the regression equation so the entrenchment has actually increased and what has happened is that we have seen between these years a reduction of the discouraged worker effect so it's almost like i mean this very strange outcome of an in increase in the number of men who move from unemployment to employment along with an increase in the number of unemployed men who remain unemployed can be explained by the fact that fewer men are exiting the labor market and more men are remaining in the labor market to try and get a job they are seeing some sort of improved economic conditions um as witnessed by the fact that few more men are going from unemployment to employment and so they decide to stay back and take their chances but this is very significant this very high rate of the entrenchment of unemployment is pretty worrying nearly 62% of men unemployed in the first quarter remain so in 2018-19 we feel and i think that this sort of analysis allows us greater power in analyzing what is happening in the labor market because the two things are simultaneously true employment generation is happening but the unemployment rate is also increasing and the calculation of these probabilities is showing us exactly what is happening that how these two seemingly contradictory outcomes can be explained very well within the same fr framework it's not illogical to have an increase in economic conditions and an increase in unemployment for a certain demographic a uh, group teasing these different movements is now possible with the with the new sort of innovations uh, afforded by the periodic labor force survey for women the story is very different uh, very stark and very worrying there's very little movement of women uh, from unemployment to employment if you will see it's only about 9 and only about 15 in 2018 it's only 15% of women unemployed women are getting a job now the jump between these two years is very significant but we have to be very cautious in interpreting this paratosh dr paratosh and i we put up a blog post at the center for sustainable employment which we showed for rural india there has been a huge increase in women's labor force participation and we are also seeing that right now after the lockdown a, a significant increase in labor force participation but a lot of them have come from self employed women who are at the very bottom end of the earning scale and a lot of them are unpaid uh, workers so we don't know the kind of work that these women are doing so we can't say necessarily that this is a good thing we just know that if you're looking at it in broad terms employment has increased but even if we can say employment has increased this is very low uh, at the best time only 16% of unemployed women are getting a job what is further worrying to see is that the share of women who employed women who retain employment is also pretty low for men it was in the 90s if you will see around 95% for women by 2018 it's 82% the flow of men from employment to unemployment is high not so for women because the surprising thing that struck us here is the share of women and the very high transitions of women who leave employment and go out of the labor force entirely now because we're looking at it at two points in time quarter 1 and quarter 4 we don't know if these women here have lost their job and instead of staying unemployed maybe they leave the labor market entirely which is something that uh, women are forced to do in a way that men aren't so we are not entirely sure what is happening but in a broad sense we are sort of, we can just present this as something very interesting and very worrying the significant movement of women out of the labor force from employment and couple that with huge 
discourage worker effect for women nearly 30% a third of unemployed women leave the labor force entirely when for men it was only about 10% only a tenth and that sort of explains perhaps why it is that the un- the, the entrenchment of unemployment for women falls it's still it's lower than that of men but the only reason why it's lower for that than that of men is simply because a lot of women leave the labor force entirely and that's a very worrying factor that the dis- that there is this clear gap in the um, patterns of the discouraged worker effect between men and women and the fact that it's women moving out into the labor force from employment is something that desperately needs to be studied as well we there's a lot of work that's being done on falling labor force participation of women we believe that these results allow us another way to examine what is happening specifically why are they leaving from where are they leaving we couldn't answer that earlier very well but now we we are able with these we'll be able to see not just why but from where are they going whether they're going from work or whether they're going from unemployment or whether they don't enter the labor force at all this we do in terms of schooling now you will see when it comes to schooling for those for the unemployment uh, part the confidence intervals are slightly wider as compared to the employed part because there are very few of those with schooling who are unemployed simply because those with schooling and lower levels of skills find any sort of work in the informal economy it's still quite significant that even if we assume this which is a broad characterization of informal markets that stands uh, that stands scrutiny that those with lower levels of skills and lower levels of education will find employment faster because there's so much scope for informal work it's still worrying that half of those with only schooling remain unemployed for a year or at least at the beginning and the ends of the year this is extremely worrying because it's really shown that even at the bottom end at the informal economy when you would expect at least some amount of labor absorption i mean uh, the whole point of the uh, informal sector we consider it as a louisian sector as a, some sort of sink for labor that it just absorbs the labor here we are seeing that that also doesn't really seem to be working nearly half of them remain unemployed for an entire year with very high movements out of the labor force the discouraged worker effect is also pretty high right and this is remain uh, remember controlling for women right so we are controlling for gender we are saying keeping everything else constant if you have some amount of schooling even if i control for gender 20% of them are still leaving the labor force entirely which is pretty significant and uh, pretty worrying and finally we show it in terms of graduates and for graduates again we can see that um the movement from employment to unemployment is lower for graduates than those for those with schooling so the presence of high skills acts as an insurance against losing your job but the presence of high skills does not allow you to find a job very well so if you get a job when you are a graduate there's a very low chance that you might lose your job but to get that job is it itself very hard and this is evident by the incredibly high figures for the entrenchment of employment here it's nearly 67% in both years so even with this increase in economic conditions that we are seeing the ability of graduates to get absorbed into the labor market is very low even though this the movement job creation for them has increased again we don't know what sort of jobs we don't know whether these are jobs suitable for their levels of skills if these are high paying jobs we can't say anything about it at this level but we can say that even though that this job creation has increased this unemployment remains very high because of a reduction in the discouraged worker effect so graduates are staying in the labor force for longer trying to get a job because they see certain people are getting a job and this is happening even though that they are getting uh, sorry they are staying in the job and this is happening even though they a majority of them are not able to find jobs over an entire year um one thing again i just wanted to okay i think we'll come back to that it's something interesting with respect to women i um i we can possibly discuss that a little later we are able then to calculate these transition probabilities disaggregate them by age and gender so for we calculate transition probabilities for at every 5 year gaps for ages and we can so 
This increase here is basically saying we disaggregate them for men and women for both years. And it's very interesting, you know, that we are seeing that the retention of employment is sort of uh, easier seen for those who are old as compared to those who are young. But the possibility of losing your jobs is more uh, significant in those who are young as compared to the old. So this reduction, this downward movement here is basically saying that if you are young, right, there's a greater chance that if you are employed, you will lose your jobs. And so the, this shift in the age category of it also, and the, uh, the impact of age also something significantly to be seen that the young don't necessarily have a great time of it in the labor market, as can be seen here. The movement from unemployment to employment is increases with age. The retention of unemployment reduces. Older workers seem to have it slightly easy to move from unemployment into employment. Younger workers find it harder and younger workers seem to remain in unemployment for a longer time. Now, there's a lot happening here. It could be the fact that the unemployed, older unemployed workers are moving out of the labor force faster than the young. As can be seen, this is for women. So here, um, unemployed women, for instance, in 2018 are moving out of the labor force faster. Your unemployed women in, 2000, uh, in 2018, younger ones are staying there for longer. So there's a lot of events happening here, but this gives us a broad idea of what's happening, that the impact of unemployment seems to be highly significant for women, for, men, uh, for younger individuals as compared to the old. And this is a problem because everything that we would think uh, needs to be done for a fast growing dynamic economy, we see the reverse here. Skills are not guaranteeing you a job. New entrants into the labor market are not able to find a job very easily. There is one problem here because we are not following an, a single individual over the length of their working time to see the moment when they are unemployed and the moment when they get a job. We have artificially put one restriction to say it should be between a year. So a lot of things could be happening. We may be, you know, it just might be that the un older unemployed individuals are um, spending a longer time in the labor force than the young because the young enter the labor force sooner. That's completely possible. Within the realm of our sample design, we're unable to capture that. But I think we can still say something extremely important here, which is that younger individuals are remaining unemployed for a year at greater rates than older individuals. And this is definitely something that needs to be looked at and tackled. This is with, again, out of the labor force. Uh, out of the labor force, actually, for a lot of them, the con we don't show confidence intervals. But for movements from out of the labor force into unemployment and employment, the confidence intervals are very wide. You can't really say anything because these flows are not uh, very easy to capture because relatively fewer number of people engage in these flows. So these are just some broad findings with regard to what we have. The same thing, uh, whatever I have spoken till now, that there's been an improvement in conditions, greater flows into employment, greater retention of uh, employment. Men and graduates are showing greater retention of employment as compared to women and those with schooling, the employed-employed transition. However, a very significant entrenchment of unemployment, nearly 50% of them remaining so after a year across all categories, much higher for men relative to women, very high for graduates, and a very significant discouraged worker effect, higher for women uh, than men, higher for those with schooling than graduates. And finally, for the movement out of the labor force, a very significant discouraged worker effect and a very significant movement from employment out of the labor force for women. And it's very surprising that even though by our broad statistics, we see that the labor market has improved from 2017, 18 to 18, 19, at a time when the labor market was not as good, a greater proportion of women were leaving employment. I mean, why does that happen? That's something that we really need to study. If conditions improve in 18, 19, why are women leaving in greater proportions from employment at a time when the labor market was not great? This is a puzzle we have no idea about. We need to study and look at these. 
and these also hold clues for understanding the phenomenon of falling labor force participation like i had mentioned earlier to study where it is that these women are actually leaving the labor market from so policy implications this i have a brief slide here to talk about it that the first thing that really stri- that struck us when we were looking at it is the very low rates of job creation in the urban indian economy you know we're leaving this i mean uh, to look at it very low flows from unemployment to employment we can't say right now whether these are structural flaws in labor markets whether these are aggregate demand failures or whether there is a problem between search and matching right there are three different models we can use to study this we haven't answered that yet but the, the, these are avenues for further research is it because job creators can't create jobs because of whatever uh, whatever legal rules is it because job creators are unwilling to create jobs because they do not foresee a suitable return on investment this is the keynesian view or is it because job creators are opening vacancies but are not filling uh, employment because there is an inability to match with suitable candidates and this is the whole search and matching literature which i think uh, the diamond pisaridis they won the nobel prize as a uh, to look at this so these are ways in which we can advance this study and look at it so but these are implications that need to be studied significantly one that really needs to be studied is why is it that high skills are not translate translating into employment very fast why is it that we are still seeing a situation where high skills are only giving you a longer stay in the in unemployment rather than being absorbed into employment and finally what is causing these gender differences in employment outcomes why are women leaving the labor force even from employment and this allows us to get greater direction and focus in our questions in our policy questions when it comes to looking at um what is happening with falling labor force participation uh, i'll stop there thank you very much um and yeah i'd love to hear your questions and comments on uh, what we have presented there. thank you i'll leave the slides up uh, thank you thank you very much rahul for your fascinating paper so as actually opens many dimension uh, to think about the labor force and actually uh, it shows the kind of crisis we are having because uh, we are talking of the year 20 you know 18 which was prior to uh, lockdown and the kind of job creation is really you know so the grim picture so yeah so uh, definitely is a fascinating 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 paper so so okay so uh, there are of course some of you some of already uh, have raised their hands so but but you know uh, being as moderator let me ask first question with you and then we'll go to the so look if we if we look at the overall employment elasticity when you uh, you know raise three possibilities So if we look at the employment elasticities and from 91 onwards for the, the contemporary neoliberal regime so we clearly witness is almost stagnant employment elasticity firstly and secondly if we look at the structural transformation of the economy so manufacturing sector are hardly attracting any job uh, let alone you know the movement towards anonized sector or all so even anonized sector is now reached its limitations okay so what i am seeing that okay the first possibility whether the economy is unable to create employment which which seems uh, more uh, suitable case for me but in in your opinion if urban sector is having this kind of problem so but recently for uh, probably a couple of years maybe more so the rural sector is you know uh, you know agriculture is witnessing a negative el- elasticity of employment so what what used to happens till now that agriculture used to be you know assumed as a you know last resort employment so people if you look at the proper employment dynamics you will find that large number of people in agriculture sector are underemployed okay they are given a choice they would move out and that's precisely the reason that they are even given a choice they are moving to a different informal or nice sector but how do you see uh, you know the years which is coming in which the agriculture sector is you know expelling their people and they will not get a proper job even the urban sector the crisis is there so they are not 
creating additional jobs. So how do you see the future? So because I think for a couple of more years, it's going to be very difficult for India because right. particularly growth rate is totally dealing with the employment generation, firstly. Yeah. And so, and, and secondly, uh, uh, so look, gender, as far as gender is concerned, so already Indian uh, you know, labor force participation for female is much lower as compared to the developed countries. So withdrawal of labor force, even having with, with a such a low level is in fact alarming because, you know, we see that the monthly per capita expenditure or all other aspect of you know livelihood is going down calorie intake and all those things so it means that somehow the conducive environment is not there for female to work so rather than thinking that okay there you know it's a kind of backward bending supply curve uh, rather it's it's a kind of i think condition there's a lack of conducive environment which is so which is prevailing there so what so it, i i actually want your comment on that so I, then i will of course open this yeah so uh, should i uh, respond to questions one by one yeah yeah i think you can take all the questions so and then you can also respond that will be okay. better so so then uh, i'm i really apologize could i just get a pen and paper i just need to yeah, note it sure. out yeah just i'm very sorry for not being yeah. prepared with it beforehand but i'll just get that one second Yeah, extremely sorry for that. That was very unprofessional of me. Yeah. Okay. So we can move ahead and then. Yeah. 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 Sure. So, so Ruchira. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I was just uh, listening to things. Uh, so I was thinking uh, about the women question. You know, when they are moving, like, um, why are women moving from jobs to out of to being out of the labor force? And I wonder if some clues might exist in how care work or the care ecosystem has changed in India. It's possible, I mean, of course, the explanation that the social reproduction framework gives is that, uh, you know, with state withdrawal over the years of neoliberalism, uh, it's becoming harder and harder to care for families and communities. And, uh, you know, and that would uh, place women more, uh, you know, that would burden women more with providing unpaid care work rather than going to work. The other uh, possibility could also mean a greater exploitation of women in workplaces with uh, higher, you know, I think precarity, uh, which happens through neoliberalism, it probably impacts men and women differently. And it's possible that greater precariousness could uh, push women. So there might be both push and pull factors which push women out of employment if possible. Yeah, yeah Subran? Yeah, uh, sorry for that. Thanks, the Rahul, Rahul, for the presentation. I have just a few, uh, like two questions basically regarding the data set that is there any possibility that you can control for whether the female are married or unmarried, okay, that might just take care of a bit of the problem which you're facing. And uh, also, like, uh, it will be interesting to see if you can extend the, if the data set allows you to extend uh, the, you know, the level of uh, human capital, which is proxied by the education level. I can see, like, you have uh, successfully included graduates but we know that it has been the case for long, like being just only a graduate from a college is always very difficult to find a job, find, find a job, uh, let's say in India. So it may be, uh, if you raise the bar that, uh, let's say skills or let's say education uh, with uh, let's say uh, master's level and above, probably that the, 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 the transition probability which you showed of keeping being unemployed again in the next period, you are also unemployed around 67% and so, it might give you a, a different 
uh, number just, just just on that yeah those are my just like you know comments to think about thank you thank Thanks, you yeah so uh, anjali ranjan hello hi so i have a um, first of all congratulating it's a wonderful talk and it is so close to my thesis so i was very happy to uh, listen to people who were who were like doing this in the kind of work so the first uh, thing i wanted to ask is uh, have you included state as a control variable uh, that is one and if not why because if i also do a multinomial logistic regression based on labor force participation particularly to, about women and i find that including state and because the state level variation is so large right. i feel that including state is probably important because if you're looking particularly at women you have bihar with less than 5% participation and andhra pradesh with almost 48% participation especially with respect to women so i just want to know what is your rationale in yes. if you have excluded then why you have the second thing about women's work of course professor richra has covered most of what i wanted to say but i still just wanted to highlight something from my own uh, work is that i find there is a consistent negative relationship between the probability of women participating in workforce towards and the number of um, dependents in a family dependents i define as young children and very old people so the nature of care work is i think very important as uh, ruchira rightly pointed out and the second one which is the there is that the way work is measured with respect to women's participation itself so uh, nso or plfs basically the way it classifies nsc and non nsc work sna work is uh, i feel uh, maybe probably indra hirve has said more than what i can ever say uh i think probably it might be a good idea to caution uh the readers uh, you know about yeah. the way work itself is measured and viewed uh and sec third one is that sorry i'm taking long no, uh, no. have you thought about um uh, in, including employment status as well uh, but, uh is it did you leave out employment status because it is correlated with caste because that was the case in uh you know when during my analysis the reason why i ask or highlighted employment status is this if you are in a low level service self employment and you continue to be in a low level service self employment and you are not able to move up your mobility is very restricted the chances of you dropping out will be larger right especially if you are a woman yeah so that is uh, that is all from my side thank yeah, you i i think we are running short of time so uh, i would request R, uh, ioc and nihal to be very precise and uh, ioc yeah so one line of... yeah sure sir uh, sir i want to know that why have you considered only two categories for gender and why not the others one this is my question yeah nihal nihal very very quick Yeah, yeah. Is it uh, assumed that all the people out of the labor force are seeking work? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay, Rahul. I think now. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Thanks for all your questions. Really interesting questions. Um, perhaps I could just first um, start off with questions about how we constructed the data set and the methodologies before going into some of the deeper questions that uh, Avnindra had uh, raised. um to for the questions by subaran for controlling for marriage and human capital yes both excellent questions there is a way to control for marriage i think you can see with relation to the head of household there is a way or whether they are married these questions are there in the plfs and human capital to sort of disaggregate um graduates into post graduates and above or just graduates these are ways that we can do it uh, these are of course open for deeper questions <clears throat> that we didn't specifically look at right now because we were presenting a sort of initial look at what was happening and sort of trying to just situate it within uh, the broad literature already that just takes graduates as graduates as a homogenous uh, category um, but no doubt in future work this is something for us to look at whether we can split this graduates into post graduates and uh, just ba um even marriage we can control for which we will definitely look forward uh, to in future work uh anjali the question on the on why we didn't take states 
see we the problem is that if we took one was that our aim was to present a very broad look first before going into deeper questions of what is happening our aim was to raise the questions in the first place now this is a, uh, only of individuals in urban areas and we were actually running into problem with waiting because we didn't wait all of this because the weights of each individual differ from quarter to quarter so the same if you if you have a certain weight in the first quarter you don't have the same weight in the second quarter so we are trying to wrap our head heads around that for the future studies that we are doing so if we had taken states we would have run into a problem where certain states would have perhaps very few individuals very few observations and may not necessarily give us what we were looking at but also you are i mean this is not to negate the importance of states it's uh, absolutely to say that it's something to look at but our first point was to let's get a broad overview of what's happening at a national level first to then figure out what the questions are so as you are saying the negative relationship between female labor force and uh, dependence right and uh, including the employment status this is work that we want to do in the future that we have realized it is important to look at this precisely because these results are telling us something interesting so now that we are seeing that women are moving out of the labor force they are not just staying out of the labor force they are moving out right it's two different things it's not just that they are not entering the labor force anymore those who are already in the labor force are moving out it's the co collection of all of this that gives rise to the female labor force participation so now that we know that we know to look whether to look at dependence like dr ruchira had said that it's uh, care work is a very important thing to look at now we know okay let's look at this and see what happens including employment status is something that we are doing right now to look at what is your employment status what is your wage status does your does is the transition probabilities affected by whether you are in the top percentile of wages or not so these are things that we are looking forward at and all of this is great stuff actually because it gives us things to look at on the nature of recording work definitely there is a problem here that housework and domestic work is not considered uh, economically productive work we are using terms as defined by the nss and plfs with all the problems that gives rise to that the boundary of work is considered um, economically productive and not housework uh, dr ruchira's questions of care work explaining it perhaps greater precarity <clears throat> these are definitely things that we could look at the only thing that i mean these are definitely things to look at what is just surprising me is the fact that we saw a greater movement from employment out of the labor force at a time when the labor market was not great so in 1718 we are seeing a greater discouraged okay from 1718 to 1819 the movement of unemployed women out of the labor force falls uh, right as well as the movement of employed women out of the labor force also falls now you would think that in 1819 if the economy is getting better right at a time when the economy is doing badly in 1718 why are women leaving the labor force even though they have a job it's easy to understand the discouraged worker effect you're not getting a job you're leaving but why is it that women who are already employed at a time when there's so much of unemployment at a time when jobs are scarce why are they leaving the labor force it's something that really struck me no doubt that these have a role to play but uh, i think that we need to factor this in along with this very strange uh, change that is happening between 1718 and 1819 it's something that i have been thinking of that i can't get my head around it ayushi's question why no third gender the coverage of them is woefully small in 1819 there were only 88 individuals of the third gender uh, 1718 there were only 55 so at the level of uh, such a large scale empirical work we won't be able to say anything there will be absolutely no statistical significance to those results so that is why we didn't uh, include them in the study nihal's questions are all individuals out of the labor force seeking work uh, no so that's the definition of if you are out of the labor force because if you are out of the labor force you are someone who is not working and you are not even seeking work an unemployed individual is in the labor force so they don't have a job but they are seeking work as well um i mean just a little bit of sort of same same uh, self promotion here i've explored all of this in an article on the india forum recently um so if you the recent one where i where i explained exactly how you classify unemployment and what these new unemployment figures mean so um there i've given a 
more detailed uh, explanation of what it means if you're out of the labor force and how it relates to the question of whether you're seeking work or not. Uh, Amnindra's uh, questions of falling employment elasticity and what is the future for women's labor force participation. In the context of a developing economy like India, where patriarchy is so strong, I don't know how much importance to put with a broad based measure of the employment elasticity. Because the actual time when we saw an increase in employment elasticity was in 2004-05, which was a drought year, which was a year of distress employment. In 2011-12, part of the falling employment elasticity could be measured by the fact that a lot of rural women who were working left the labor force. You know, if they are own account workers, they leave the labor force. So it's, it's very complicated. And that is why in India for a developing economy, I don't know. How, I think we need to examine it a lot more in detail to sort of see what it exactly means. Because if you're saying that a rising employment elasticity is what is needed, we saw it in 2004-05. But you are right that, the, that it is a huge problem that the Indian economy seems unable to guarantee uh, enough of jobs. There is a huge problem. Whatever the reasons are, there are lots of theories. It is something we need to look at. And what we will see, this is my, uh, like, this is my hypothesis, that what we will actually see from now, following COVID, will be a very close repetition of what we saw in 2004-05. Increasing household distress, rising women's labor force participation, which will not be a good thing because it will be in rural areas, in agriculture, in very low paid work, um, where they're trying to just supplement household incomes at the very least, which you're already on the edge of sub, uh, subsistence. I do not foresee, unless something really some sort of radical root and branch reforms are implemented. I do not see the possibility of rising employment elasticity and rising LFPRs in good jobs. In say the organized sector with good employment, I don't see anything to indicate that it will happen. Whatever increases we will see, and we will definitely see it, it is going to happen, will be in very low paid, uh, precarious natures of work. I hope that answers yeah. everyone's questions. Thank you. It was excellent session, Rahul. And uh, thank you. Uh, I think we are already uh, we have yeah covered it well, well, well before time, well, well on time. So thank you, thank you very much, Rahul, for your fascinating lecture and uh, question and answer was also excellent. You have covered all questions very carefully. So okay. So thank you, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks uh, a lot. Thanks everyone for having me here and thanks for these great suggestions, which uh, I will definitely uh, look to take forward. Um, I mean, you have my email ID. If there are any other questions, et cetera, with this, you can definitely contact me. And I'd love to take this discussion further with whoever's interested in this. Sure. All right. So probably you will get my mail first. <laughs> oh, definitely. I'm okay. looking forward to it. Yes. Yeah, sure.